Welcome back, and this is the third part of the second part of the third module. I'm sorry for doing this to you guys, but the fluid therapy part is so long that I had to divide it into three um, videos, and this is the last one of that. And this is where we discuss a fluid deficit, how to manage the different um, deficit of the different um, compartment fluid compartments of the body. So this is where we're going to do a lot of computations. So hang in there and let's start. Fluid loss. Now fluid loss or fluid deficit in the different fluid compartments would have variable clinical manifestations, right? If there is a deficit in the intravascular fluid, meaning kulang ng dugo, that is what you call hypovolemia. Hypo is low, volume is volume of blood, inya. So there is low blood volume. Right? Again, when you meet big medical terms, try to, to divide them into their po possible root words and you'll have an idea already as to what it means. You don't have to Google it instantly. You might have an idea already and that makes more... Uh, that makes a big difference rather than googling everything right so what if there is a deficit in the interstitial okay there is a deficit in the fluid surrounding the cell this is actually what you call dehydration okay when there is intracellular fluid deficit okay this is what happens when when there is deficit inside the cell the cell is so smart it gets from the interstitial Right? It instantly replaces it to, from the fluid in the interstitial compartment. Right? So when you see signs of intracellular fluid deficit, that is only actually in lab results, which is hypernatremia, you actually see signs of dehydration. Okay? Because whatever pathology is causing a deficit intracellularly, it is immediately corrected by the cell itself by its heme homeostasis a bit, a mechanism, gets uh, fluid from the interstitium. Now, the interstitium lacks fluid. And that is what we see as dehydration. Right? So, uh, let's tackle this one at a time. Let's start with hypovolemia. Okay? Hypovolemia and shock are two things that happen hand in hand. Right? So, what is hypovolemia first? Hypovolemia, again, is intravascular fluid loss and that could be caused by a lot of things hemorrhage could be external hemorrhage could be internal hemorrhage could be a problem with the blood clotting factors or coagulopathy right and so anything that could lead to a low blood volume and what happens with that it leads us to a certain um, kind of shock which is circulatory shock right this is when um, the insufficient blood volume leads to insufficient blood flow to the body tissues, which leads to hypoxia, right? Or what we call the inadequate oxygen delivery to the tissues. That is shock. That is the basic definition of shock, right? But what happens with that? With the lack of, um, of oxygen, which is needed for the normal cellular meta metabolic activities, activities, um, your body goes into a state of hyperlactatemia. Why? Because instead of O2, the cells revert to anaerobic glycolysis for ATP production. And that causes the production of pyruvic acid, which can be, or which will be in most cases, uh, uh, what do you call this, shifted or, or converted into lactate. Right? And high, high amounts of lactate in the body and circulating uh, in the blood and spread throughout the whole body leads to uh, some form of cell and tissue and organ death. Right? It, it causes dysfunction in the cell membrane, tissue damage, and further organ dysfunction. That is the basic pathogenesis of how people die from lack of blood. Right? And even animals, right? Now, let's go into circulatory shock because it can be of different types. Okay? The type of shock that 
occurs in the circulatory system depends on which part is dysfunctional or is failing. And what are the components of the circulatory system? Yes, the heart. What else? The blood vessels and the blood itself. So you can actually think of this as a, a, a plumbing system, right? I don't know if this is the class that I use the analogy for that in. Um, you have the heart, which is the pump. Ito yung motor, right? This is the, the motor that drives the, the, the plumbing system. The blood vessels would be the tubes, diba? Yan yung mga tubo na nakakonekta dun sa motor. And the blood would be the water. So, so the motor, the heart, pumps the blood out into the blood vessels for wherever it is needed and wherever it needs to go. So, um, anything that could affect each component of this system has its own kind of shock. For example, if there is something wrong with the heart, for example, the heart is too weak to pump blood, right? It leads to lack of tissue perfusion as well. If it is not in sync in, in its conduction, in pumping, then it actually causes oxygen not to be delivered properly and at the right time. That is actually what you call cardiogenic shock. And this, is, this happens in patients with congestive heart failure, valve degeneration, and such. All right. Now, kung may problema naman sa blood vessels, that is what we call vasodilatory shock or distributive shock. Now, ano ba yung pwedeng mangyari sa blood vessels that could cause the blood not going where it needs to be? Take anaphylactic shock. When allergies happen, there is that heightened level of inflammation inside the body, histamine is released, and the capillary permeability decreases. So a lot of things can actually leak out from the blood vessels and that is um and causes vasodilation with that correct so what happens is instead of the blood going where it needs to go it goes to certain places it leaks out from the blood vessels and it fails to oxygenate the tissues that needs to be oxygenated right so paano naman kung sa dugo ang may problema all right walang problema sa pump the blood vessels are fine there's just not too much blood kulang ang dugo then there's what you call hypovolemic shock. And why is it important for you to identify the causes, the specific cause of the shock that you are seeing? Because the treatment would also be specific to that. For example, in cardiogenic shock, you might see your patient decompensate, decompensating, mababang heart rate, it's not perfusing, and you think, oh, maybe there's something wrong with the blood. Pero paano kung heart pala yung may problema? So, if you, if you want to fix um, the problem with the heart, you don't give it fluids, right? Because there's no problem with the amount of blood inside that body. The problem is with the pump, right? So, if you give it fluid, if you give it aggressive fluid therapy for a cardiogenic shock or a vasodilatory shock, you are causing more problems to the animal, right? So, identify it, the different clinical manifestations of these different shocks is for patho for you to teach all right for me i am going uh after hypovolemic shock because this is what needs aggressive fluid administration and that is our lecture for today all right so hypovolemic shock this is the inadequate blood volume again Right? Causes. Number one, hemorrhage. Could be due to surgery, could be trauma, neoplasia, getting that blood from the intravascular system and just staying there. Um, in cases of anticoagulant rodenticide ingestion, um, also fluid loss. Right? When we say fluid loss, vomiting, diarrhea, renal disease, leading, uh, leading to uh, polyuria and hematuria, whatever that is removing that... Uh, because whenever that is removing the fluid in the intravascular space how so how so right when again when your intracellular um your intracellular compartment needs fluid it goes to the interstitium right pag wala na yang makuha sa interstitium okay remember there's a there's a homeostasis thing that we have to maintain Kapag tumaas ang number of solutes in the interstitium and the intracellular compartment, what will the fluid in the blood do? It will shift in direction. 
right? Like your like how the hypertonic and hypotonic fluids happen. You know that mechanism. They will go into the intracellular because they would want to sustain the cellular function. Ngayon, nawalan ka naman ng fluid sa blood vessels. Right? So that could also cause to hypovolemic shock. Another would be severe burns, right? Loss of blood plasma after skin and vascular damage. Right? And third space losses, whenever um, you have, uh, you're facing a pathology or a disease we're in, fluids are stuck in the interstitial space. And that is seen clinically as edema or ascites. Ascites is when you have fluid in the abdominal cavity. Edema is when you have fluid in your subcutaneous space. Right? So what are the stages and how would you recognize hypovolemic shock in any patient? Right? You first have to understand the different stages of hypovolemic shock. And this is specific to hypovolemic shock. Right? I'm just going to go at it uh, quite fast. Compensatory, progressive, and decompensatory. At first uh, the first stage, right, compensatory, the body recognizes that there is lack of blood volume, so your body will try to compensate. Kulang ang dugo, bibilis ang heart rate ko para marating nung natitirang dugo yung mga tissues na kailangan ng, uh, na kailangan ng blood, right? Elevated respiratory rate because dahil kulang, dahil mabilis ang heart rate, mabilis dang ang respiration. Again, your ventilation perfusion balance needs to be maintained. Vasoconstriction. Since konti lang ang dugo, your body will try to prioritize what organs need to be perfused. Right? It will put the first priority as the, the, the main organs, the heart, lungs, and brain, and then go into your abdominal organs. And ang, ang pinaka least prioritize niyan would be your extremities. That's why you feel cold. That's why you have pale mucous membranes because those things are not important for your body. Your body is saying the blood needs to go to the brain, the blood needs to go to the heart and the lungs, right? In cats, the, the stages are not clear because they tend to, to decompensate really fast. That's why they have bradycardia already. If this is not recognized by a clinician and it progresses, the normal to hypotensive BP remains hypotensive the heart rate slowly um will gradually go down the heart rate and the mental state will be altered as well because there is now less uh, blood going into the brain and your brain is very dependent on oxygen and glucose right and then again if you do not recognize it it will enter into the decompensatory phase and everything will just go down right a heart rate of less than 50 for dogs less than 100 in cats Severe, uh, low BP, low temp. Everything is just shutting down. All right. So in any stage of this, right, the first or the best uh, option that you can give immediately, immediately would be fluid therapy. Right. It would be fluid therapy. Now, how would you know if your patient would benefit from fluid therapy? Um, it all depends on how they look, number one. That's why physical examination is very important. But whatever you are handling different patients, wh however long you are, <laughs> you are a vet already, or how fresh you are in the industry, you have to remember that an individualized fluid plan is needed for every patient, right? There is no one rule that can apply for all patients because the patients never... Um, uh, never look the same and will never react the same. You might think they do, especially if, if you're tackling a very common problem like parvo or distemper or heart work, right? But still, you have to be to have an open mind. That needs to be. Um, kailangan yun itrain sa inyo na wag mag tunnel vision. Like when you see when you see a patient with uh, to call this vomiting diarrhea smells fishy you know um unvaccinated puppy you immediately think parvo yeah sure that's tunnel vision and that uh that actually can be advantageous in the moment because you're very good at your job you're a very good diagnostician however what if there is another underlying condition that you uh chose not to look for because you're already 
fixated in one problem, right? That's why you have to be thorough. You have to think open-mindedly about how to approach these um, patients, all right? So I'm going to um, shift into how we actually stabilize with fluid therapy. I, I am not going to apologize as to why the background for fluid therapy is like an hour long because how would you know how to give it and what to give if I don't give you all that information that we have just discussed for the last hour, right? So let's go at it and as to how we give fluid therapy, all right? The question is always, how aggressive should my fluid therapy plan be? And fluid therapy is done in three approaches, and it all depends on how, how bad your patient is, right? How badly it needs stabilization with fluids. So there are three main approaches. Number one would be resuscitation. Two is replacement. Three is maintenance, right? The resuscitation approach is applied for patients in shock, okay? hypovolemic shock specifically. They're showing signs of hypovolemic shock, or you can see that they are suffering from active hemorrhage, right? This, uh, these patients need aggressive fluid therapy, and they need the resuscitation approach, right? And this is usually a ladder system, okay? After you have resuscitated a patient in shock, you check now if they are showing signs of or or if they have ever shown signs of dehydration and or ongoing losses right some patients right some patients para malino na ngayon pa lang, some patients might need resuscitation but then they're not dehydrated right that's why the the, the difference between hypovolemia and dehydration needs to be very clear Hypovolemia is loss of blood volume. Dehydration is loss of fluid in the interstitium. Okay? That's why how aggressive your, your uh, administration of fluids also would differ because you will be more aggressive in resuscitation as compared to replacement. Right? And some patients, like for example, a surgery patient who went in for like a, a spay and then something bad happened during surgery, you nicked an artery and now it's having active hemorrhage. That patient is well hydrated, but it is hypovolemic, right? And the cells cannot, cannot compensate that fast for that active loss of fluid. That's why you need to do resuscitation, right? Not every patient which you resuscitate needs replacement. Right? Not every dehydrated patient needs resuscitation. That's why how you, how you assess your patients is very important as to the success of your fluid therapy. Right? Now, for maintenance, bakit siya tinawag na maintenance? Because it's just to maintain the normal volume of the patients. Right? For them to, to keep on um, uh, their cells, to keep their cells working. Right? So, doc, kung you hydrated naman, you hydrated means it's well hydrated. It's normal volemic. Why do I need to give extra, extra fluids, diba? It's well hydrated naman, so I don't need to replace. It's normal volemic, normal ang blood volume. I don't need to give it anything. However, there are some, uh, some conditions, like in surgery, wherein you need to give fluid because, number one, they're not eating, they're not drinking during surgery. So, for you and they're continually losing fluid during surgery even if you don't see the blood okay they're still producing urine they're still producing stool they're still breathing and those are losses for fluid so those are usually maintained by the food and the water but during surgery you're withholding all of that that's why you need to give them a, a certain level of maintenance right let's start with the first approach uh, get your calculators ready, <laughs> All right? This is gonna be easy, but you have to be, you know, um, the problem with this w in, in students is that they think of this as a rule, as number one rule. I cannot steer away. You have to, because I'm not gonna ask you in the exam of to like compute this and that, multiply this and that. I'm not gonna steer you that way. What I'm going to do is give you a clinical case and you figure out what to do, right? Again, surgery is when you feel that you're a veterinarian already, then might as well max it out, right? 
so you know um this is where your clinical thinking gets trained right when you're actually going giving fluids how much of the fluids you're going to give and how you monitor them after you give your fluids right let's start with resuscitation the most aggressive way of giving fluids right so if there is hemorrhage or you're seeing signs of shock doesn't matter if it's compensatory decompensatory or progressive there is what we call a shock dose right the shock dose is actually equal to the normal blood volume of the animal right and that is given like, that is given to the animal in quarter doses to prevent overload let me give you a graphic right you have a dog and a cat the shock dose for these animals would be for dogs that would be 90 mil per kilo all right that is the total blood volume they have all right for for cats that's 60 mil per kilo all right now when you have a patient who, uh, who needs resuscitation right your first bolus or your first administration of fluids needs to be a quarter of that meaning times 0.25 <laughs> right so 90 times 0.25 is 22.5 mil per kg um 60 mil times 0.25 again quarter doses is 15 mil per kg of isotonic crystalloids and this is given over 15 minutes as a bolus so you can imagine if we are treating a 10 kilo dog and it is actively hemorrhaging in front of you right how much um lrs are you going to give this patient as a bolus so you multiply 10 kilos with the standard there which is 22.5 mil which is 225 ml right so just imagine that's also already a quarter of a liter right that you are giving over 15 minutes now the, if the shock dose is normal blood volume why can't we just give 90 mil per kilo a god but automatic the the shock is cured the thing is some shock right you, you don't exactly know what stage of shock they are you you can't pinpoint it you can you can argue it with me na ah, doc, uh, okay pa bp um mataas yung heart rate pero doc malamig siya yung ganun. you don't know when it will progress to from compensatory to decompensatory you can you, you cannot time it eh. so for you to prevent any any uh, adverse effects of giving so much fluid nang hindi naman pala kailangan you divide the shock dose into four so your first bolus is 22.5 mil per kg you give it and then you assess right kung wala pa rin, you give another bolus until you were able to give the shock dose right and some patients who will not tolerate that much fluids again what i discussed earlier small animals uh, cats those with cardiopulmonary dysfunction, baka may existing cardiac problem, or you could actually hear a murmur or something, um, you could shift to another kind of fluid. You could give colloids, right? Um, which is 5 mil per kg over 15 hours, or hypertonic saline, which is 2 to 4 mil per kg over 5 minutes, with a max of 5 mL per kg in dogs and 4 mil per kg in cats. Now, if we are in a normal, normal, uh, um, college setting wherein you are in school and you're taking your exam in a you know in the usual way yes you need to memorize this but you are not <laughs> right so it's way easier for you right now right now what is the what is the um, prerequisite before you consider hypertonic saline and colloids you cannot use these fluids the colloids and hypertonic saline if your patient is also dehydrated why how do hypertonic saline work how does how does it work hypertonic saline and colloids work in a way that they will attract the fluid from the extravascular space into the intravascular space so kung dehydrated ka na dun sa extravascular space kung kulang na yung fluid sa interstitium and the intracellular compartment ano pang mahahatak ng hypertonic saline mo it will not work. You're just basically giving giving more problems to the animal. 
right? So you have to consider all those. If your patient is hypovolemic and showing signs of dehydration, then the only way to go would be your isotonic crystalloids. All right. Now, after you gave the first bolus, how do you know it's actually working? How do you know that you're able to restore blood volume? The clinical signs that you saw earlier that made you recognize that it is of a shock um, status, that should be reversed. All right. Now you would have a normal heart rate. Dogs, would, dogs and cats would have these um, numbers. The mucous membranes would be back to its normal color and moisture normal capillary refill time and all that so everything basically will be improved now you may see you may see that it improved after your first bolus of 225 mils right but it doesn't mean that you stop monitoring because it will only if you are not fixing the problem like for example it is actively hemorrhaging and you're still looking for the artery that got nicked or the vein that has been torn whatever the, the reason of the hemorrhage is, then it will continue to lose the bolus that you gave. So you have to continually give resuscitation dose um, for those patients until you fix the reason why it is losing blood volume, right? Because kapag tinigilan mong i-monitor yan, just count 5 to 10 minutes, it's gonna go back to the decompensatory shock signs, right? The heart rate would go down again, the BP would go down again, right? So basically, that is it for resuscitation. You just have to recognize, monitor, and uh, give whatever it needs, right? And then you, you, you shift. Then you shift once the patient has stabilized, right? Once you have figured out what's wrong, you have ligated the artery that's actively bleeding, um, then you shift. You shift to what it needs next. Now, if your patient is not dehydrated, is not dehydrated, then you go into maintenance rate, right? right? And make that clear. Again, if your patient initially needed resuscitation but is not dehydrated, right? You can shift to maintenance directly after stabilization of your patient. However, if your patient is dehydrated as well, then you have to give replacement fluid, right? Now, dehydration is uh, assessed through an estimate, right? It's usually just an estimate of how much interstitial fluid is lost in your patient. Now, typically, dehydration is not life-threatening, especially uh, like for us. We can feel dehydrated with drink water and that's it, right? Basically, our body will tell us what it needs. That's why if you drink too much water, your kidneys would be like, hey, we're working, don't overwork us, all right? So um, usually it is okay until it progresses to a greater than 8% dehydration. And how, how do we recognize dehydration in our patients? How do we see um, signs of dehydration? Number one, the mucous membranes would be dry. The normal mucous membranes would be moist. They would be pink. But if the mucous membranes, you touch them and they're dry, then your patient is dehydrated. The level of skin tenting, we discussed this as well. Um, uh, Laboratory-wise, the PCV, the pack cell volume and total protein would be elevated because there is less fluid in there. Sunken eyes, doughy abdomen. So anyone who bakes, it basically the consistency of a dough, right? Because in a, in a normal abdomen, you would be able to feel for... Um, the, some of the organs you would be able to feel for the intestines it wouldn't hindi siya dapat parang isang malaking um bola lang right azotemia also uh, of course is expected for dehydration because your kidney is uh what do you call this is overworked right there are a lot of physical exam findings of dehydration and it would all depend entirely on the veterinarian you talk to a lot of veterinarians would have their own system of dehydration they might not be uh, focused on such um, gradations or criteria so it all depends on them and it will also entirely depend on you as well now in our problems in the like for an exam or in the problem sets i will be giving you the percent dehydration already right and for me 
like uh, I, I learned this too um, with a colleague that all patients suffering from vomiting and or diarrhea sorry or are always set to be at least at least five percent dehydrated agat Right, so th this patient might have, uh, you know, a normal skin tent, normal mucous membranes, but if it is suffering from vomiting, or diarrhea, or both, then I usually just put it as five percent dehydrated. So how do we compute for the replacement volume? Right, how much does this patient need? Okay, remember, dehydration kulang siya ng fluid, so you need to give it back. You need to rehydrate the animal. The question is, by how much? Right? So, the formula for the replacement volume is fluid deficit, yung kulang na fluid, plus ongoing losses, yung patuloy niyang nilalabas na fluid. Alright? So, let's start with fluid deficit. This is why estimation of the percent dehydration is very important. Okay? Because this will give you an idea. Is this an accurate count? Um, is this the most accurate count? No, but it is close, right? Basically, it's an estimation. So you take the body weight of the animal in kilos, right? And you multiply that by the percent dehydration. And the, and the amount that you will get is in liters, right? Don't forget, it is in liters, unit of measurement. And this should be given over six to eight hours with isotonic crystalloids, right? Now, six to eight hours is not set in stone. For some animals, like cats, small dogs, those patients with an underlying cardio or pulmonary disease or both, um, this is lengthened to 12 to 24 hours because they cannot tolerate large amounts of fluids going into their system. They get drowned, basically, right? So, again, this is a rough um, protocol. You might meet some veterinarians who might steer away from protocol, but then again, that is their style. This is mine, right? Now, that is fluid deficit. We still have ongoing losses. These are the fluids actively lost by patients per day. And there are two types of ongoing losses. Number one would be sensible losses. Usually, this, uh, this can be quantified. Urine stool vomit. Um, urine can be quantified if the patient is catheterized. For the stool and the vomit, if they are so... Fluid D, they're liquid um, Some veterinarians can estimate na tipong, oh, that vomit is around 20 ml, 30 ml. It's all up to them now. It's all up to you, right? The insensible losses are those that cannot be quantified. Respiratory losses, those lost in pan during panting, uh, when they sweat and such. And since these are... Uh, these things may be quantified, but it's hard to do so. So they just used a a, um, a standard or a constant for it. Sensible losses is estimated at two mg per kg, uh, two mil, sorry, two mil per kg per day. I'll correct that in the PDF. Two mil per kg per day. Um, and if the patient is vomiting or diarrhea or both, the call this the sensible the insensible losses sorry which cannot be quantified would be 20 mil per kick per day all right all right <laughs> all right now let's have an example for this example one scarlet now a three-year-old intact female still intact a female mixed breed dog which weighs 15 kilos assumed to be 5% dehydrated, dehydrated after an acute bout of gastroenteritis. Um, and um, after you check the animal and done a physical examination, right? You have decided to rehydrate this patient with lactated ringer solution. Question number one. How much LRS will you be administering to replace the fluid deficit? Right? How do we find... Or how do we compute for the fluid deficit again? We multiply the body weight by the percent dehydration, right? So fluid deficit is equal to 15 kilos multiplied by... Now, this is where some students get it wrong. It's, it's not 5, it's 0.05, right? It's 0.05, don't forget that, right? And that is equal to... 
15 times 0 0.05 is 0.75 liters. Correct. Do not forget about the unit of measurement. Some students make it into ml. No patient will benefit from a 0.75 ml fluid. All right. Now, that's not it. Um, that's the fluid deficit. How about ongoing losses, right? What if, uh, um, that's question number one. The question number two here is, uh, what is the total replacement volume? What if I want you to um, find out the replacement volume for this one? So we have to compute for the ongoing losses. The ongoing losses would be, uh, what's the constant that we had before? The insensible losses would be a constant of 20 mil per kg, why did I why did I do that? Because it is it has gastroenteritis, so it entails that your patient is either vomiting or diarrheic or both. Alright? So 15 times 20. You need a calculator for that? Hmm. Might be. Alright, I'll shut up about it. Go go get your calculators out. <laughs> 15 times 20. 300. Alright, 300 ml. Now the the, the sensible losses would be 15 kilos times 2 mil per keg, that is 30. So you add that, that, those are your ongoing losses of 330 ml. So your total replacement volume would be 1,080 ml LRS. How did they get 1,080 ml? You add the fluid deficit and the ongoing losses. Your fluid deficit is 750 milliliters plus 330 milliliters of ongoing losses. That's 1080 ml per LRS, all right? Now, next question. Now, if you chose to replace the fluid loss, the fluid deficit over six hours, what is the drip rate? I'm just looking for an ml per hour here. Okay, now you have your replacement volume of 1,080 ml per day. Right, that is computed per day. Now you want to give this over six hours. So what, uh, how fast would your fluid uh, should be administered to your patient per hour? You just divide 1080 by six hours. Good. So 1080 divided by six, 180 ml. Correct. All right, 180 ml per hour going into your patient. Now, when you administer these replacement fluids, you wait for the six hours to be over, and then you monitor your patient. You check if the degree of dehydration has improved, or is it non non-existent already, or um, did it not um, did it not improve that much, or in the same uh, capacity that you thought or you expected. Right? But you do your monitoring after you're done with it. Okay? And in some patients we're in, you think it's severe dehydration, especially for large animals, you would actually give it over like over three hours. It all depends on the situation. Right? Now question number three. If Scarlett was found to have a pre-existing heart disease, note she does not have. Scarlett is my dog. Right? The replacement needs to be given over a longer period of time, correct? So I chose 24 hours, right? So what is the new drip rate? We started with question two, over six hours. I wanted to prolong that. Um, I, I don't think Scarlett could handle 180 ml per hour. Her heart might uh, go into uh, too much strain in pumping that much blood, right? I want to prolong it over 24 hours. What is the new drip rate? So you have a replacement volume of 1080 ml divided by 24 hours, that is, Okay, you need your calculator for that. I needed, I needed mine for that. What's the answer for this? And, I'm, and imagine, I'm recording this without actually expecting you to answer, but let's go. <laughs> 45 ml per hour. Now, this is where um, the practicality of the Philippines comes in, right? In, in advanced countries, they have IV machines, right? You, you connect the IV line into this IV machine. You plug in your drip rate. You, put, you, you click 4 and 5, 45. And that machine will make sure that 
the patient will receive 45 ml of the fluids per hour. Kaso, sa Pinas, walang machine. What do we rely on? Gravity. Right? We rely on gravity. And this is where the knowledge of the IV lines come in. IV lines, yung nagko-connect dun sa bote, papunta dun sa catheter ng pasyente mo. Right? Are manufactured in two ways. You have an adult and a pedia. The adult will administer 20 drops to give 1 ml to the patient. The pedia, it takes 60 drops na mahikita mo dun sa bevel, dun sa, sa, sa area na yon, for it to be equivalent to 1 ml. So we don't count the drip rate sa Pinas into, um, what do you call this, milliliters per hour. Okay? Because we have no way of knowing. Right? But we have devised a way to, to at least make sure or get close to 45 um, by converting the drip rate into a different unit of measurement. So we start with 45 ml per hour, correct? I need it. I need that ml per hour to be in a unit of measurement of drops per second. How do we do that, right? In one hour, how many minutes are there? Because we need to cancel this out. How do you change unit of, units of measurement? You need to cancel things out, correct? Right, all right. So we're gonna find a way to cancel things out para yung dulong, dulong sagot is drops per second. 45 ml times one hour per 60 minutes, right? Because I need to convert the unit of time na hour from hour to seconds. Right? So, I need to convert that. Times 1 minute over 60 seconds. Again, this is basic algebra, I think. All right? Now, now this is a way for us to cancel out hours. Diba? Hours into seconds. Now, I need to cancel out ML into drops. And we have the, the, the constant there on the right side. The IV line for adult and pedia. Now, here goes. If your patient, if your patient is more than 10 kilos, more than 10 kilos, all right, usually you go for the adult IV line. If your patient is less than 10 kilos, you go for the pedia. Now, is that written in stone? Of course not. Of course not. If you, uh, it, it's up to you to assess it. I, I make these computations in my head whenever I choose what kind of IV line to have the assistant set up. But it's entirely up to you. Talaga. Right? Now, for Scarlett, who weighs 15 kilos, right? Um, I choose an adult IV line. And that is 20 drops per ml. You cancel everything out. You divide where it needs to divide. 45 divided by 60. Divided by another 60. Multiply that by 20. What are you going to get? It doesn't actually, it doesn't actually um, affect the answer if you multiply 45 to 20 and then divide that by 60 and 60. All right? 45 divided by 60. 0.75. Divided by 60 again. There's another 60 there. 0.0125. You multiply that with 20. Multiply, not divide, huh? Multiply. Because 20 is now in the, new, in the upper part of the fraction. That is... 0.25. Do not forget the call this. Do not forget the unit of measurement. Now it is drops per second. Now doc, how do I count that? Drops per second. How do I count 0.25? The fact is you can't. But one what you can count is the drop. So how many seconds would it take for you to see one drop? Now th this is where it gets tricky. <laughs> Because for some for, for for some students it's automatic. How many drops would it take? How many how many point twenty fives would it take for it to reach one? One divided by point twenty five lang yun. Four, right? So that's one drop per four seconds. So when you 
um, what do you call this? That, that can be rewritten as that one drop per four seconds. So in the clinical setting, when you are um, uh, administering these fluids, right? Um, I, I think I messed up by not showing you what a fluid line looks like. I, I was actually thinking you know already what it looks like. But you have this, um, this knob wherein you can dictate how fast the drops would go and how slow. And this is also where you actually turn off the IV line, the IV flow, right? And you can actually see and um, adjust the line for it to only drop one drop per four seconds, right? And that is your replacement rate already, okay? You wait for that to finish for 24 hours and that's it. You monitor. For some, they monitor after 12 hours or, you know, in, in the middle of the time duration they chose. That is entirely up to you, all right? So that is how you actually compute for your fluids, okay? Now, pre-surgical stabilization. If you're doing just normal elective procedures in a patient which is not dehydrated, would you need to give intravenous fluid therapy? Parin? This is a normal hydrated animal undergoing surgery, which I discussed, I think, earlier. I already said the answer before. Yes, but why? Again, you need it for hemodynamic support and perfusion maintenance. Remember, Patients who undergo elective surgical procedures, so elective surgical procedures are those which can wait and they're usually depending on the owner if they want to get it done. So the patients who undergo these procedures are fasted before the surgery, right? Uh, they, the food and water are withheld for a certain number of hours. So the patient is not receiving any kind or any level of hydration. Right? So you have to make sure that the cells inside a patient's body are going to work through the surgery, after the surgery, for it to recover good. Right? So ideally, ideally, yes, you need to give intravenous fluid therapy. However, would I expect that to happen in a, in a, in a, in a spay and neuter campaign? Of course not. But I, what we usually just put IV, uh, IV line in a, in a spay and neuter campaign would be big heavy uh, fat female dogs because spaying them is co has more complications than other other um, animal species and other body condition scores okay there's a very high possibility you get hemorrhage with them that's why I an IV but in an ideal setting wherever you actually go except for the Philippines or any other third world country I don't, I don't want to hate on my country I love but but the thing is when you when you when your eyes get opened by what is what needs to be done and what is right and wrong and that is ingrained to you because you get paid to to do the right thing it's hard to go back it's hard to go back it's hard not to hate it's hard not to call out the things you see wrong right and that actually applies for a lot of things other than surgery all right, and in, in, in any facet of the clinical setting, in any kind of behavior, that's just how it is. Once you're woke, once you're truly woke, you're gonna have a hard time to, to go back. All right, now uh, we discussed resuscitation, we're almost done with the second module, <laughs> with the third, the second part of the third module. Okay, we're done with resuscitation, we're done with replacement. How do we maintain? Right? So when healthy patients, normally hydrated patients, are not eating or drinking, which is very common for that operative period, um, the maintenance volume would be your go-to rate to supply the animal during uh, for fluid therapy, right? Like for example, some patients are not eating or drinking for like three days, and you might not see some signs of dehydration, right? So you ha you want to go, you, you still want to give it fluids. That is your maintenance rate. And that is classically two meal per cake per hour. Me teaching right now uh, large animal surgery, it is the same maintenance rate, actually. Um, horses would go to 2.5 mil per cake per hour, but it's just around the same uh, interval or reference there. 
Um, in some literature, you might see 40 to 50 ml per kg per day for dogs and cats, but I'm going to show you why it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right? You could choose whatever rate you want to apply. Is it 2 ml or 50 ml? Okay. Um, a 10, uh, an example, a 10 kilo, 10 month old, intact male schnauzer is going into preoperative preparation for routine gastration. It's a very heavy schnauzer if it's 10 kilos, right? What is the drip rate for the patient before anesthetizing? Because again, there's another uh, fluid rate for surgery, right? Maintenance, let's apply first uh, 50 mil per kg per day, right? Let's use 50 mil per kg per day. So 10 kilos times 50, I'm going to be mad at you if you're getting your calculators out again. Come on. 500 mil per day. Now, that is how much per hour? 500, again, this is rate. Remember how we computed for that before? How much ml of fluid are we giving per hour if that is the rate per day? 500 divided by 24. Hmm? 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 What is it? 20? I'll go with 20 mil per hour, right? 20.8333, I think. That 0.83, you're not going to see that if you're just relying on gravity. And IV machines, um, if you're giving more than 10 ml, Per hour it wouldn't detect the point something else at the end of it all right now let's use the other maintenance rate which is two mil per kg per hour so use 10 kg okay 10 kilograms times two that's 20 mil per hour right so basically they're just the same some literatures will i don't want you to get confused so if you choose 50 ml per kg per day it's pretty much the same thing as two mil per kg per day if you choose 40 mil per kg per day, that's just a difference of around, I don't know, maybe maybe now it's around 18 or 17 mil per hour. It's okay. All right. Now, during surgery, during surgery wherein there is more need for fluid, right? Why? Because you need to make sure that um, the cardiovascular system will still be functioning well. Anesthesia would render different body systems to depress, right? It would cause the heart rate to go down, respiratory rate to go down, the temperature to go down. That is just what anesthesia do. Uh, yeah. So what else? To compensate for any fluid losses during surgery, the preoperative fasting, evaporate, uh, evaporative loss <laughs> during surgery. So the surgical fluid rate, right? Maintenance is when you before you start surgery. Once you're, you're about to start your surgery, you bring it up to 10 mil per kg per hour, right? From 2 mil per kg per hour to 10 mil per kg per hour. Now, is it always like this? Again, no. A lowered rate of 5 mil per kg per hour is deemed adequate for healthy patients undergoing minor and short duration elective procedures like castration, right? You don't want to, to put too much. Uh, if you assess this animal to be well hydrated, you think it's going to eat right after the surgery you don't have to worry about it it's quite young um then you can do a lowered rate of five mil per kg per hour right and in some uh cases actually when you do surgery of patients with a cardiac problem you know they have that elevated surgical risk like we discussed before you can even um uh disregard the surgical rate and just stick with the maintenance rate because you don't want to risk putting too much fluid in those guys, right? And for those uh, young and small patient patients, the fluids need to be pre-warmed if possible, all right? So that caps off part two of module three. Why did I even consider, uh, we call this, discussing fluids? In just one meeting I don't know but somehow we make it you know it's, it's less than it's less than a it's less than a it's less than two hours <laughs> all right so there is still a part three don't forget that is blood transfusion I will see you in the next lecture video thank you everyone